prove that up in him. Every song we sang this morning was about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. You see, there is no other like him. It is said in Isaiah 43, 10, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, there will be none after me. Jesus Christ is God. He was with God from eternity past all the way into eternity future. He is supreme above every single thing. He conquered death on the cross. That's where we can sing, oh, I rejoice in that day. I rejoice in that day that happened right there. Because if that hadn't happened, I'd be wallowing in mud and I'd be headed on a fast track to hell. Man, we wander around sometimes like thinking he doesn't matter. Acting like we can do whatever we want. Like children who've gotten out of the house and away from their parents and think, well, I'm going to do that because they don't let me do it in their house, right? Mm -hmm. We need to understand it's because of Christ we stand here. It's because of Christ we breathe. It's because of Christ we can move in the midst of tragedy from triumph to triumph. God, we just say thank you. Help us to never lose sight of you. Never lose sight of how you speak to us. Help us to always focus on the love that is in your eyes. We try and go other places looking for love, but it is only in your eyes. So we just want to thank you, Lord. We want to rejoice in you. We want to just say, God, we need you. God, how we need you. Help us this day to truly remember that we only rejoice because of what you have done for us, flowing out of who you are. We thank you, Lord. We bless your name. Amen. Amen. We need to be planning ahead for bounty. Bounty doesn't just happen. We need to plan ahead. There was a missionary in Africa who had a farm some miles from the mission station. The season had been very favorable. He had a large crop of corn that needed to be harvested. So he made a public appeal to the villagers. And he said, on this day, I want you to bring a basket. Meet me at the farm, and we're going to pick corn. He needed help carrying the corn from the field to the mission complex. He named the day, and on the day, day he named, scores of men showed up. Now for those of you who don't know, a score is 20. <coughs> so scores, it's plural, they had at least 40 men there. I think probably more. You know, um, I've been in these poor villagers. They're always looking for a job because jobs are scarce. And someone you respect, like at the mission complex, when he says, I want you to come, they come. They have great respect. So some had baskets enough that were large enough to hold over a bushel. And some had very small baskets that they brought. At the close of the day, the containers were all filled for the last time, and everyone walked to the mission station carrying their basket of corn. When they arrived, the missionary said, thank you very much. I really appreciate your help. I'm so glad you were able to be with me today. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the corn that is in your basket and carry it home. Wow. Those who had the large baskets, you can imagine how they felt, right? <laughs> woo -hoo, I got a bounty. But the ones who had a small basket in their head, like, why didn't I bring a bigger basket? What's my problem? How, how could I have done that? You see, God is desiring to produce a beautiful crop, both in you and through you. He invites you to fill your basket. 
It's really your choice, the size of basket you take. But he wants to fill it. It's even your choice if you choose to listen and respond to him and actually bring a basket in which to carry his bounty into your life and into the life of others. So your life of faith is the basket. And although you can't have faith other than the faith of Christ, <coughs> you can squelch how much faith is allowed to grow inside of you. Your basket is determined by the size of your prayer life. I can see the wheels turning. <laughs> see, prayer is simply just connecting with Jesus. It's just acknowledging that he is sovereign, that he is before all, he is after all. Yes, Lord. And that he is right there in the middle with you. Yes. He didn't just leave you. Yes. Every area of a Christian's life must be filtered through prayer in order to produce good fruit and have a good return. Prayer is simply talking. It's like when I'm up here, I'm talking, and Glenn is speaking back. That's just, that's what we do with God. She's mostly listening. I'm mostly talking right now. But that's just prayer. Just like, it's that simple. She's not pretending to be something she's not. She's just responding to what she hears. She's not thinking, oh man, I don't have a college degree. I, I can't say an amen when and where, and, or I can't say yes, or I can't respond. No. It's the spirit within her that's responding. That's what prayer is. The spirit within you responding to the Holy Spirit. Responding to what Christ has done and is doing. Responding to the love of the Heavenly Father who says, you are in the center of my eyes, and I love you. With everything in me, I love you. I can't love you any less. It's not a part of who I am. I love you. Pretty amazing. Prayer is simply talking. You know, my husband tries to engage me in conversation all the time. <laughs> while I'm reading, while I'm watching TV, you know, whatever. <laughs> but he tells me things that he thinks I will find interesting. He compliments me. He reinforces my strengths. He calls me out on the carpet with my weaknesses and says, how can I help you? You know, that's all prayer is. He loves to hear my voice. Our Heavenly Father loves to hear your voice. And especially when I'm sharing something I'm passionate about or something I've learned. This is prayer. It's so simple. Prayer is the preparation of the ground for planting. You see, if we don't pray... There's not good soil for the seed to fall on, and it won't grow properly. In times of prayer, the pruning of our lives needs to, needs to happen so that we can produce full, sweet, and luscious fruit. I don't know about you. I don't really like pruning. I don't really like being wrong. I mean, can you can not say anything, okay? <laughs> you know, it's just the way I, I am, yeah. and... The Lord's working me through that, and he always will be. Mm -hmm. Prayer is an investment towards a large prayer basket. And a Christian must invest in others what God has shown in the light of his kingdom through prayer. Mm -hmm. By doing so, growth happens, blessing happens, and understanding happens for both you and the one you're investing in. It's so rewarding. James 1.22 says this, But prove yourself doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. You see, a hearer doesn't do, but a listener hears and does. A son will hear and do because they love the Lord. So receive the word. I've had this scripture mulling around in my spirit for several weeks now. I've shared uh, a part of it at the Global Apostolic Meeting. Um, most pastors will not preach out of this book because of the pictorial language it uses. Um, so I'm going to go there. Um, because even though most pastors will teach it allegorically, it really is a, a good reference for sound marriage relationship. And you know, in our country right now, in our world, 
we need to not shy away from that which will help us be sound in our understanding of what God says. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, I will switch it over to apply it to us as believers in the hands of an almighty God. Um, but it, it is really about a relationship between a husband and wife. But I think we can understand how God feels about us when we address this. You know, <clears throat> God often has things in here that have more than one meaning. Because he is a God who is multifaceted. And we are people who find ourselves in different situations from time to time. And so when the Spirit quickens something within you, um, that's because he wants to take that scripture and apply it. So anyhow, this is a, a song or a, a poem about the love between a husband and wife. You know, honestly, if a newly married couple read the Song of Solomon, they'd really understand what it is to love and be committed to one another in a faithful, monogamous relationship between a husband, gender male, and a wife, gender female. Okay? That's what we're talking about here. So if you're listening online, that's what I'm talking about. So if they would take it to heart, their marriage would prosper. Allegorically, if we as Christians take this to heart about our God, our heart will prosper, our faith will prosper, our basket will grow. Okay, so um, if a culture were to really listen to the message found in this book, Song of Solomon or Song of Songs is where I'm going, just for a moment. If a culture would listen to it, it could change a nation's outlook on morality. You see, right now, our nation's outlook is immoral. We just say anything goes, okay? Anything goes. But in God's morality, anything does not go. He says, I have your best interest at heart, and your best interest is one male, one female, joined together in marital union that loves and respects and builds up and helps one another. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so hang in there, girls. I won't spend the whole time on that, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, good. It's a relevant book for today. In fact, this whole thing is relevant for today. We need to read it with an understanding of the Holy Spirit, so we can't do it alone without him. If a Christian were to listen to the message held within, like I said, you would grow and you would prosper. You would understand the voice of your beloved. You would listen in anticipation for his visitation. And you would do whatever it is he says to do because you love him so much. So, Song of Solomon. Chapter 2, starting with verse 8. Listen, my beloved, behold, he's coming. He's climbing on the mountains and he's leaping on the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or like a young stag. Behold, he's standing behind a wall. He's looking through the windows and he's peering through the lattice. In biblical times, the couple would be betrothed or engaged in a formal ceremony. And once the ceremony is completed, it is legally binding. It can only be broken by divorce. But what would happen is the bride would stay in her father's house, and the groom would go to his own father's house and build a room in which they could live once it was finished. Well, you can imagine when it's finished. I mean, they had a parade better than our 4th of July parade, right? They would gather all their friends together. The groom would say, it's the day. I'm going to pick up my bride. Come with me and celebrate. And there would be like tambourines and drums and cymbals and people would march along and blow the shofar and they'd get all excited and they'd sing because what is better than a wedding? A groom going for his bride. On the other hand, she had to be ready to receive him whenever he came back. She never knew the day and the time, but she had to know the sound of his coming. She had to understand his voice. She had to be a good listener. And she had to understand what was happening around. So she always had to have one ear waiting for her groom. That's prayer. In this song we read, the bride knows the voice of the bridegroom. She says, listen, 
Listen, I can hear him. He's coming. All of our cares are over. All of our hopes and dreams will finally be realized. We must get to a place, church, where we come to him merely just to listen. That we may hear him in order that we may do his will and please him. Because he has all wisdom. He has all love. He has all understanding. He has all of everything. Brian Simmons writes, truly embrace God's spirit inside of you. Truly embrace him. And encounter him before you run to anyone else. Because when you start with him, your heart is prepared to hear wisdom and guidance as he speaks. And then you'll understand when he chooses to speak to another. So trust your relationship with him above all others. Let's go on to verse 10. My beloved responded, and he said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers have already appeared in the land. The time has arrived for pruning the vines, and the voice of the turtle dove has been heard in the land. The fig tree has ripened its figs, and the vines in blossom have given forth their fragrance. Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. It's really very compelling, isn't it? It's like, oh, I want to go there, you know? He tells her the winter is over, and the time for the pruning of the vines is here. You know, there's a season when everything in our life seems dead and done, you know? And then all of a sudden, the winter is over, and you're on to a new phase. But that phase is not always an easy phase. In Israel, the time for pruning is usually February to March. It's the time for the vine dresser to cut away all the excess growth that has happened the previous summer. There's actually mission trips to Israel for men where they can go and be a part of this pruning. And apparently there's a lot of learning and a lot of opening of the scripture that happens. So I watched a few videos. I'm not a guy, but I was curious, you know? I watched a few videos. Uh, we've had grapevines in our yard in the cities, but we've never pruned them properly. So our fruit was always very small. There's one main vine coming out of the ground, and it's attached to the vine are all these little branches coming out all over. The vine is staked to a fence just to keep it upright. And you prune it because you want the light to develop the fruit. Okay? And you prune it down to about that much of a branch sitting. Do you ever feel like you've been pruned that far? <laughs> like, seriously. Everything else is gone. You prune it. That All this unnecessary growth from the summer has to go. There's just way too many branches that will suck the nourishment out of the vine and not produce anything. You prune in order to make it better. You keep the branches that are closest to the vine. Hear me. And you keep five to eight on each side of that main vine coming up. The rest are trash. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it can bear more fruit. He wants you to be fruitful and bountiful. In the natural, when Jesus walked this earth, being the vine, he had six branches on each side. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So think about that vine of Jesus with these six branches coming out on each side. And look at now and how many believers there are in the world. So if we allow Christ to prune each one of us, there can be exponential multiplication. A lot of fruit together. Not fruity fruit, just fruit. So in prayer, we meet with our beloved. And that's where the word comes. 
That's where direction flows. That's where our basket grows and is filled. We receive what has been gathered. Jesus says in Luke 8, 15, But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word with an honest and good heart. They hold it fast, and they bear fruit with perseverance. You see, again, the same thought. They've allowed that pruning. They've allowed whatever is going on. They're listening. They're hearing. They're doing. They're holding on. And their basket of faith is growing. So we must invest in the word. You've heard the word, the voice of the bridegroom in that quiet moment. You go out of your prayer time and chaos erupts around you. That happened to anyone? Man, I'm so on fire for God. I'm going to go out and I'm going to conquer the world around me. And you open the door and you don't even get one foot out of the, across the threshold and all of a sudden, the kids are fighting, there's bills that need to be paid, and you have no money. There's uh, the neighbor that's yelling because your dog is barking. There's just all this chaos. What do you do? What do you do? You hold fast, and you continue forward with perseverance. You hold fast to what you learned, what you heard, what you experienced in that prayer. And you continue to move forward with perseverance. You don't give up. Cindy and I were talking this morning, and, and we were talking about how it's sort of like when you're on the boat in a storm, and you can't turn the boat sideways because those waves will flip you. And so you turn into the wind, and you continue with perseverance to go towards your intended goal. Kind of that same thing. Hold fast, bear for, it with for, forbearance. Because God always plants good seed. And his crop is likewise. It's good. Nothing can strangle the seed that is planted in a good heart. Nothing can shrink your basket of faith. Except for your lack of faith. Your unbelief. So we have a bounty of good works. As our heart is remade by the cross in those times of prayer. I like dogs, so I'm going to share a story about a bulldog and two Dobermans, okay? All right, good. There was a bulldog pup who lived in a fence yard, and about three doors down were these two Dobermans. This bulldog, he loved to play in his yard. He was so sweet-tempered. These Dobermans were mean and aggressive. They were the chaos standing outside your door, right? Mm -hmm. Every day, they would go by the little bulldog and harass him. They thought it would be fun to dig under the fence so that they could attack him, give him a rough time. That little bulldog put on a smile as he saw them digging under the fence. Okay, this will be interesting. The little bulldog lunged at the first Doberman and clamped his teeth down on the Doberman's ear and wouldn't let go. And that Doberman shook and shook and shook and finally tore him off. His ear was ruined and he scrambled back under the fence. And the second bulldog saw what was happening and he started to scurry under that fence too and that little bulldog clamped onto his leg and wouldn't let go. It didn't matter what they were doing. And finally he let go those Dobermans went back under the fence. They never, ever got them again. That's what it means to grab hold and not let go. Grab hold of what God is doing in that prayer room. What he's speaking to you. Listen and do it. Because it's in the doing that it cements in your being. Grow that basket. These Dobies, they had an awakening. Wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Guaranteed, they would never bother him again. Baby Bulldog refused to give up. He held fast. He persevered until they fled. He actually shined light on the situation, wouldn't you say? Like, you're not going to touch me just because I'm little. You know, sometimes you might feel little. Continue to hold fast and press on. Let's go to Luke 18. I mean, Luke 8. Luke 8. I did give you the right scripture, right, Nan? Luke 8. Luke 8. 
Verse 16 says, Now no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed. He puts it on a lampstand so that those who come may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. In Matthew 5, we're called to let our light shine so that others may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Followers of Christ are lamps of God. We're like that little bulldog shining a light on a situation. Whatever the situation is, if it's our own situation, if it's someone else's situation, we need to be shining our light. But we need to shine it in a way that reveals faith. The size of our basket will determine the size of our light, right? So we need to be able to be light shiners, lamps of God. A lamp sheds the light of his kingdom in order to impact and enlighten the world. That's what we need to do. When we talk about things going on in the election, we don't talk about an issue just to prove someone's wrong. We talk about an issue in a way that actually enlightens them and helps them. And you know, if we go in there like, no one's going to listen, right? So we can ask questions and all of that. We must shine our light in a way that people will receive and understand and be prepared for Judgment Day. We can only give out as much light as we gather while in prayer. Little prayer, little light. Some prayer, some light. No prayer, no light. But what can happen with much prayer? We can have an ab lots and lots. We can have an abundance of light shining forth. You know, that's why you guys get caught up in there. Mm -hmm. God meets you. He starts talking. Mm -hmm. Prayer, relationship with the Spirit of God, allows the light to shine brightly. That's what we want to do. We need to be bright lights. Mm -hmm. So we're called to invest or cast our light out on the darkness that others are living in. Anyhow, these elections are going to be, well, they already are, confusing for some, clear for others. So we need to take the clarity of what God says about these issues and bring it out. Because the riches we impart are the only riches we will attain. It's the only wealth that we will ever, ever see or have. But there are some words of caution that Jesus uses. He says this in several areas. Um, when he's telling these parables, John 15, 6 says, If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. This is the picture of pruning. This is a picture of mold spreading. The mold and the rot of a life that doesn't invest in prayer. It's a picture of what happens when we don't invest what God has given us. In the video I watched of the vine dressers, you know, when they were pruning those branches, they were just kind of thrown down. And then they were gathered up. And at night, before they were done with their work completely and go back to their place, they would put them in a spot and light a huge bonfire with them. That's pretty sobering. Anything that was unuseful would end up in that fire. Usefulness is developed in the listening time and proved in the doing. We might say, oh, I listened to the Lord and this is what he said. Well, did you do it? Well, no. Well, then you didn't really listen. You only heard. Mm -hmm. So we need to be listeners. We need to be doers. Luke 8.18 says, take care of how you listen. For whoever has... To him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. This same tenor is depicted in the story of the talents in Matthew 25. You know the story well. The master went away. He left his servants in charge. He gave one five bucks, one two bucks, one a buck. Okay? That's it in a nutshell. He never told them what to do with it. But it appears... They may have known him well enough to know what they should do with it. You see, we excuse away our behavior by saying, well, I should do that, but I got called to do this, or, you know, I did that, or 
whatever. When the master finally returns, the servants were called to him to make an account for the money he had given to them. The first two doubled it. They knew what the master wanted done with the money. And the third one dug a hole and buried it. He had no basket. He had absolutely no basket. The first two had a basket, different sizes, but they had a basket. And they used that basket. They did what they could with that basket. But the third one was afraid. He was paralyzed with fear. It's not that he didn't hear. It's not that he didn't know. <coughs> it's that he explained it away. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. What did the master say? He said, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I do not sow, and I gather where I scatter no seed. You should have at least put it in the bank. You should have at least gotten some interest for my money. Pennies on the dollar, right? And then he says in verse 29, For to everyone who has, more shall be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. God is serious about you investing in what he's given you. He's serious about you investing in, in the love that he's given you. In time that he's given you. He wants to talk with you as a husband would talk to his bride. He wants to be able to spend time with you. He wants to hear what's on your heart. But we must take care of how we listen. In a world in which there's always a rush, we need to slow down. Make sure we take time for the Lord. Make sure we take time for prayer. Because that is where faith grows. That is the place where his light shines on us. That is the place where we learn we actually can do great exploits when they're led by him. Because he will always accompany us. And he never fails. Amen. Chuck Swindell tells a story. I could be telling this story, quite honestly. He found himself with too many commitments in too short of a time. He got nervous and tense about it. He says, I was snapping at our wife, at my wife. I was snapping at our children. I was choking down my food at mealtimes. And I was feeling irritated by those unexpected interruptions throughout the day. He recalled this in his book called Stress Fractures. What a great title of a book. He says, before long, things around our home started reflecting the pattern of my hurry-up lifestyle. It was becoming unbearable. I distinctly remember after supper one evening, the words of our younger daughter, Colleen. She wanted to tell me something very important that had happened at school that day. So she says, Daddy, I want to tell you something, but I'll tell it really fast. And that just hit him. And right there, he realized her frustration, he repented, and he answered, Honey, you can tell me anything you need to, but you don't have to tell me fast. Say it really slowly. You know, we just need to slow down and take time with our Lord. Amen. Because he wants to speak. He wants us to grow in faith. He wants us to invest in others. You see, the law of prayer is the law of harvest. If we sow sparingly, in prayer, we will reap sparingly. If we sow bountifully in prayer, we will reap bountifully. The trouble is, we're trying to get from our efforts something we never put into it. It takes an effort to set aside time to pray. It takes an effort to really listen. You know, praying with our mouth, speaking, is really easy. But sitting there long enough to really listen to the heart of God is so difficult because we can't get control of our minds, right? Mm -hmm. We need to do that. I want to, I want to have a crop that is bountiful. I want to have a big basket of faith. And I want to be able to, to go out and do what I'm hearing in the prayer time. Our beloved calls him to himself. Just going to end, wrap it up with this. Song of Solomon 2, chapter 14. This is what he says. This is 
so my God, that beautiful one. In the clefts of the rock, in the secret place of the steep pathway, let me see your form. I want to see you. Let me hear your voice, your voice so beautiful to me. I want to see you. Your form is lovely. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that are ruining the vineyards while the vineyards are in blossom. See, our, our Heavenly Father desires you. Can you just say that? My Heavenly Father desires me. My Savior loves me. Sometimes we have a hard time with that. We find ourselves unlovable, unworthy. And he says, no, I love you with an everlasting love. He desires to spend time with you. He desires to hear your voice and to tell you things. We have communion today. But I want to ask you a few questions after I read this communion scripture. It says, a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he's to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. See? These are some questions I want you to ponder. You know, our communion table is open. If you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord, you are welcome to partake with us. We just ask you to hold it and we all take it together. But while you're sitting here, I want you to just ponder. We're going to have some music playing. What is hindering me from receiving everything he has for me? What is hindering me? And what stops me from sharing him with those around me? It doesn't have to be weird. It doesn't have to be intense. It could be a thought shared. It could be just a hand on the shoulder. It doesn't have to be weird. And yet, Sometimes we still hesitate. Why am I hesitant to invest in others what God has invested in me? <coughs> See, because these are the little foxes that ruin your vineyard. These are little moths that eat away at your basket. This is mold that will make your basket unusable, useless vines. These little foxes must be identified and destroyed. And then you must gather your basket and pick from his fields all that you can hold. On the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. For as often as we drink, eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We just want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you. Continue to speak, for your servants are listening. Continue to woo us and call us to your side. Help us to be sober-minded about what is driving us. Help us to be quick to come to you.
and not so quick to go to others first. Help us to display in our lives your character and your light. Lord, we want to have big baskets in which we can move because we want to see your kingdom expanded. Grow us up, Lord. We just praise you, Jesus, and we thank you.